Thank you. Let me begin by reading to you from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, verse 1 and following. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were heathen, you were led astray to dumb idols. However, you may have been moved. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one, by speaking through the Spirit of God, ever says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of working, but it is the same God who inspires them all in every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits and to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All of these are inspired by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. And so we have many gifts, but there's only one Spirit, the same Holy Spirit. And so in this presentation, I'm going to speak to you about the Holy Spirit as the gift who contains all gifts. I told you earlier that the real reason that we have serious difficulties uh, in the world, in our country, even in the church at times, that can all be traced back to serious difficulties within individual human beings. <clears throat> That's called sin. Pope John Paul II, in his post uh, synodal apostolic exhortation on reconciliation and penance made a statement like that. He said, all the divisions we see in the world, countries against countries, uh, the divisions we see within individual countries like our own, the divisions in communities, the divisions in parishes, dioceses, the divisions in families, you know, the divorce rate is now over 50%. And interestingly enough, the divorce rate for Catholics is pretty much the same as it is for everybody else, which is somewhat of an eloquent statement, I think. But all of those divisions can be traced back to the divisions within individual human beings. And the Holy Father said that division is called sin. So all of it relates back to sin. You evict the divine guest, the Holy Spirit, through serious sin, mortal sin. Um, and this is a huge problem. I remember at one time when I worked for a certain bishop on the West Coast. Um, in those days, I don't know if they still had them, but back in those days, they had a, um, a thing called colloquies of bishops and scholars. And uh, I, I, by hook or crook, a certain archbishop, um, who, 
who's now the uh, prefect for the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, uh, kind of got me snuck in the back door as a ringer in some of these uh, colloquies. Imagine me going to a colloquy. That's like one bishop said to me, now, John, I want you to be smooth. <laughs> me? <laughs> smooth? But the archbishop got me into these, and, and, and what it is, it, it was a number of bishops. I don't remember the exact number, but, you know, say 12, 13, something like that, and a like number of theologians. And we would spend a day seated in a, in a circle, um, and there would be a presenter in the morning and in the afternoon. So after the first one, then, we had, uh, I think, five or ten minutes to speak to the person at our left and our, and our right to discuss what we had just heard. And then they went around the room, and each one of us had five minutes to make an intervention. And the first presentation in the morning, I remember it very well, was by a certain professor of moral theology of a West Coast seminary. And I'll never forget the statement. He said, we no longer believe in sin. I'm not sure who the we is, but he said, we no longer believe in sin. We don't talk about sin. You can talk about immaturity. You can talk about making bad decisions, but never mention the word sin. Now remember, he's talking to bishops and scholars. Well, there was an archbishop on my left, and after the presentation, we talked, and I'll never forget this either. The archbishop said, well, you know, now, by the way, the theme of that conference was on moral theology in the light of veritatis splendor, the splendor of truth, which was an encyclical, and the catechism of the Catholic Church. So moral theology in the light of the encyclical Splendor of Truth and the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So the presenter, his theme was, we don't believe in sin. The Archbishop said to me, ah, I don't know, we're kind of wasting our time on this. The real problem is humane vitae. Everybody knows Paul VI was wrong. <clears throat> this is an Archbishop, and he was in his see for about 30 years. And I said, oh, well, you should bring that up. Anyway, it came time for my intervention. Guess what I talked about? <laughs> right, sin. One of the first parish missions I ever did, the, the pastor picked me up at the airport, and he was uh, somewhat visibly nervous, I could tell. Now, this was years ago. This was probably, oh... 16, 17 years ago, but my reputation had already preceded me. And he was a good man, but he was nervous. He said, Father, now, I, my, my, I have good people. And, I, and I, I could have finished his thought. I have good people. Please don't talk about sin. Now, this was a, a Lenten mission a parish mission during Lent. How am I not going to, I mean, I don't want to accentuate it, but I got to mention it. He said, please don't talk about sin. I said, well, well, it's Lent. What do you want me to talk about? We'll talk about love. I said, okay. So I did. <laughs> and you know, lack of love concerns a lot of sin. So, I was obedient. Another time, a good bishop said to me, after he told me he wanted me to be smooth, he said, now, John, I want you only to speak of positive things. Don't, don't bring up any negative things. 
and I just, you know, the thought that came to me, and, I, you know, sometimes it's like Jesus said, don't worry about what you to say. Right? The Spirit will give you the words you need when you need them, where you need them. And I think that happened at that moment. He said, never, don't, don't, don't talk about anything negative, only positive things. I said, Bishop, what happens in an electrical current if the only thing you have is the positive pole? You eliminate the negative pole. What happens? The power fails. The lights go out. Darkness falls, and indeed, if your light is darkness, how deep, how very deep will the darkness be? Accentuate the positive, but you can't leave out the negative. Talk about grace and all the good things. I don't like talking about sin and hell, but I'll darn sure not leave it out. It's pretty much an essential element of what we believe. You evict the Holy Spirit through serious sin. Now, okay, you know, you can be restored, of course, to grace. You repent as Catholics. We go to confession. And by the way, the forgiveness of mortal sin, serious sin, the only ordinary means we know of after baptism, I, now note the words. Somebody always misconstrues or misquotes me. That's why almost everything I've ever done is preserved for posterity on videotape, audio tape. You know, they'll say, ooh, Father Crappy said that. No, listen carefully. The only ordinary, now note the modifying term, the only ordinary means of the forgiveness of serious sin after baptism is the sacrament of penance. Ordinary means. Now, could there be an extraordinary? I mean, of course. You know, you, you can certainly, you know, you're, you're going home, home, I'm going home on the airplane, it starts going down, you make a good act of contrition. If you have sins, could, could God forgive you? Of course, of course. But that's an extraordinary circumstance. After baptism, the, ordinary, the only ordinary means the church knows of for the forgiveness of mortal sin, serious sin, after baptism is the sacrament of penance or reconciliation. Confession. Now, I, I, I talk a lot about excellence. And sometimes people might think, well, okay, good, that sounds okay, but what does that mean? You know, for us, we're talking about moral excellence, spiritual excellence. You have to be in a state of grace. You do the best you can to preserve a state of grace. That way, you don't evict the Holy Spirit. And then you will have the Holy Spirit to guide you, to help you. You'll have eyes to see and ears to hear. You'll be able to walk. You won't be crippled. Be careful with sin. We're all sinners. We know that. I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. You fall, get up. Go to confession. Do what you can to preserve yourself in a state of grace. Because if you're not, you become horribly vulnerable. I could tell you war stories for hours on end of well-meaning people, disbelieving people, unconcerned people, young people frequently, who, you know, drift off into sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You know, promis promiscuous lifestyle, permissive lifestyle. And they're not like evil. They're not making a conscious decision to follow the devil. No. You live in mortal sin. And I'm not, I'll tell you, there's a difference between committing a sin and living in sin. You know, we can all commit a sin. We can all fall on our face, but, but you get up, you repent, and do it as fast as you can, and go to confession as quickly as you can, but don't live in sin, meaning day after day after day, confirmed in sin, shackled by sin, 
because then you are open to all kinds of evil. No, oh, I've seen terrible examples of young people who, oh, they didn't do it on purpose. They just drifted into it. And, and they, they fell into terrible, terrible slavery to the devil. And by the way, like I said before, I'm too old, too far along in the journey to play silly games by leaving essential parts of the faith out. Now read my lips, good Catholics and Christians. If you don't believe in the existence and activity of Satan and the fallen angels, you are a heretic by definition. You had better believe it. That is essential teaching. Now it's uncomfortable teaching. We don't like to talk about it so much. Uh, the world thinks we're crazy if we bring those things up. Even the church, in, not the church officially and formally. No, we, we know what we believe. And, and the magisterium of the church teaches truth and is faithful to the, to the truth. But individuals sometimes are embarrassed by the truth. Right? There, there are priests and bishops and theologians even and religious and some lay people too. Although I blame the lay people much less than I blame us. But, but they become embarrassed by our teaching. That's because the power of the Holy Spirit is not working. The spirit we've been given is no timid spirit. Other translation, the spirit we've been given is no cowardly spirit. You know, a lot of people are embarrassed by the church's teaching on angels and fallen angels and grace and sin. Embarrassed by the church's teaching on abortion and artificial contraception. Timid! That is a malaise. That is a sickness that afflicts the body of Christ as well as the rest of the world. And we better do what we can to make sure it's not a sickness unto death. Now, the church isn't going to die. That can't happen. Not because of us. We can fall away. Uh, we can sin. We can be disinterested or cowardly. Uh, that, that's not the church officially. That's a member of the church. Uh, always make the distinction. You know, we had, I think, a, we, we've had some real lapses in common sense and thinking in recent years. You know, when we went through the terrible scandals um, in, in 2002 and the following year, I, I heard it, one woman collared me in an airport, grabbed me right by the lapel, and said, I'm mad at you priests. And I knew what she was talking about because it you know, was front page news. And I said, you're mad at us. You won't believe how mad I am. You don't have to dress like this in public. You didn't get spit on last week in an airport because you were a priest. Don't tell me how angry you are. When I got into this, it was a perfectly respectable thing, and there was a certain amount of, well, respect. That deteriorated over time to the point where a lot of us were somewhat timid, embarrassed, frightened to be in public even. That attitude we cannot have. We have to do everything we can, one person at a time. Uh, don't, don't think in this, you know, well, well, the bishop didn't do this. Well, the pastor didn't do this. Oh, the priest didn't do this. There, there are basically two kinds of people. Those who make excuses and those who make it happen. Make sure you're on the right side of that. Losers make excuses. 
Winners make it happen. And that's true in every sphere of influence in humanity. That, I know that may sound harsh to some people, to separate it into winners and losers. Let me tell you something. Whether I, 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 I've been around athletics in my younger years. I was around the military. I was in the corporate world, the church. Yes, there are some differences, but not really. The essential principles are the same. They're the same. Make it happen. Don't make excuses. Winner, loser. You decide. And that's in your own place, in your own way, according to your own state in life. So that's first and foremost. Preserve yourself in a state of grace. Then the Holy Spirit will operate, and that gift, as, as Pope John Paul II used to, he liked to refer to the Holy Spirit, and he wrote extensively on the Holy Spirit, the gift who contains all gifts. The Holy Spirit, the gift who contains all gifts, will dwell within you as in a temple, as St. Paul teaches. And then you'll have these gifts of the Holy Spirit, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, when do you get the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit? I could put that on your exam, right? Uh, at the same time, you get the infused gifts of the, or the theological virtues, right? You know what they are, faith, hope, charity. When do you get faith, hope, and charity at baptism? The gifts of the Holy Spirit. When do you first get the Holy Spirit? Not confirmation. Baptism. And I know that you know the gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? Um, later this afternoon when we lock the doors <laughs> and hand out the examination papers. And, and one of the questions is, what are the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit? I know you'll get it. Wisdom. Now, what's wisdom? Hey, if you have the Holy Spirit, now as I'm delivering this to you, I, I want you to kind of relate it to yourself, to the world, to what's going on. Now, the, the, the gift of wisdom, gift of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, what is it? Well, with the gift of wisdom, we see God at work in our lives and in the world. For the wise person, the wonders of nature historical events and the ups and downs of our lives take on a, diff a deeper meaning when you have the gift of wisdom. The matters of judgment about the truth, listen to this now, the matters of judgment about the truth become more clear. If the gift of wisdom is operating in your life, you're not going to have the gift of wisdom if you don't have the Holy Spirit. After you baptize, how can you lose the Holy Spirit? Mortal sin. Serious sin. It can be restored, of course. You repent, you go to confession. It's restored, regenerated. But that's wisdom. That explains a lot. With the gift of wisdom, the matters of judgment concerning the truth become more clear. I've met thousands and thousands and thousands of people in traveling two million miles or so over the past 12, 13 years. I've met some very intelligent people. I've met some very simple people. My grandmother had an eighth grade education And in the matters of judgment concerning truth, she was way ahead of a lot of people with multiple doctorate degrees that are operating today. Why? Holy Spirit. The gift of wisdom. Have you ever wondered how it could be that anyone in their right mind could possibly justify the outrage, the crime against humanity, the genocide of abortion. I don't care if you're a plumber. 
a professor. I, I have people that I, I, I've known, pagans, outright pagans. who don't get it. They'll say, well, yeah, you know, it's a no-brainer. What else would it be? You know, the great statesman, Conrad Adenauer, after World War II, um, he was the chancellor of Germany, and he, <laughs> I've quoted this statement of his many times. He said, God has placed obvious limitations on our intelligence but none whatsoever on our stupidity. <laughs> Amen, Mr. Chancellor. How, what else would this be? And, and I'll tell you, the contortions that the human mind can go through are usually the result of a twisted heart. These are not stupid people. Intelligent, highly educated people who just don't get it. I've read the Supreme Court's decision in Roe versus Wade dozens of times, every word of it. I have five university degrees. Four, four of them after I became sane, four of them were earned. The first one I got in business administration when I still was in a, I'd lost my mind. But four of them were with highest honors. I paid my dues. I respect education very much. I have some. The degree of darkness is incredible. How they can rationalize, justify, and otherwise contort, distort, and destroy the truth is as profound as the mystery of iniquity itself. What else would it be in the womb? A rock? A plant? an aardvark, an elephant. From the first moment of conception, it's a human being, and it's not a potential human being. It's a human being with potential. This fatal error is the single biggest threat to Western civilization that has ever existed. I assure you, if you can extinguish the life of an innocent human being through abortion, you can do anything. Do not be surprised if we have assisted suicide under the specious pretext of mercy. Do not be surprised if at some point the government will determine who lives and who dies because we can't afford the health care. Do not be surprised at that. All of it is totally predictable up to and including genocide if you can murder a child in what should be the safest place in the universe for him, his own mother's womb, if you can rationalize and justify that, then you can rationalize and justify anything. And do you know why this lie has been perpetuated? Because you and I have been weak in the knees and soft in the spine. Be soft-hearted, but not soft-headed. And we have had weak leadership. You know why? Because you didn't demand better. 
And that doesn't mean you rashly judge or criticize people in leadership positions. They're in a tough spot. But you've got to pray for our leaders. You must strive for excellence. You know, listen, it's easy to criticize, hard to live it, easy to talk, hard to walk. You have to do it, one person at a time. Wisdom, if you've got wisdom, you can impart wisdom. You can't give what you don't have. How are you going to give your children wisdom if you don't have it? You may say, well, they won't accept it. That, that's not your fault. Your job is to pass it on, but you can't give it if you don't have it. You won't have the gift of wisdom without the Holy Spirit. You won't have the Holy Spirit unless you're in a state of grace. Understanding. Gift of understanding. With the gift of understanding, we comprehend how we need to live as a follower of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now that's not immediately evident necessarily. You've got to have the Holy Spirit in order to have that gift of understanding. A person with understanding is not confused by all the conflicting messages in our confused and disoriented culture and about how to live. This gift of understanding has also been called common sense. The gift of understanding perfects a person's speculative reason in the apprehensions of truth. As St. Thomas Aquinas teaches, it is the gift whereby self-evident principles are known. No person with the gifts of the Holy Spirit could ever possibly rationalize or be confused about these crimes against humanity, such as abortion and others. You know, there's confusion because they don't have the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, so, sometimes people in my position are, are, are somewhat timid or afraid to say this, but, oh, you're judging. You know, they, 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 they use that. Oh, you're judging. Don't judge. It says in the Bible, judge not lest you be judged. You got to know what it means. A better translation is condemn not lest you be condemned. You have to make judgments. You must make rational judgments. You must make moral judgments. I'm telling you, history will record that this generation was irrational and immoral because we were afraid to make rational judgments and moral judgments because of political correctness or whatever other malaise afflicts society. You must make rational judgments. My, my mother told me when I was a little boy, when you cross the street here, you've got to look to the left and to the right to make sure no traffic is coming. No traffic. You make a judgment, cross the street. Traffic, judgment, don't cross the street. That's a rational judgment. You've got to make moral judgments too. This is a specious argument. And there are a lot of them today. There's a, an attack on language among other things. But, but you've got to make moral judgments. How do you make moral judgments? In light of objective truth. Certain things, objectively speaking, are good or evil. Now, there are, there are people, including inside the Catholic Church, some theologians, who will argue against them. And they'll, they'll base everything on what's called situation ethics, which is a bankrupt kind of a position. Not right. There is objective good and evil. Some things are intrinsically evil. Always and everywhere they are evil and there is no justification 
based upon the subjective situation of the individual. Now, subjective things can constitute mitigating circumstances. We know that in law, and it's the same in moral theology. The habituated nature of an action, uh, mental incompetence, uh, immaturity, and so forth. Yeah, those can be certainly mitigating circumstances. Things like abortion, euthanasia, they are objectively, intrinsically, always and everywhere evil. And you can't justify them for any reason. Once you get away from that principle, it's a slippery slope. Believe me. What, but what's the remedy? It's very simple. The Holy Spirit. So that's understanding. Counsel. The gift of counsel. That, that's also been called right judgment. With the gift of counsel or right judgment, we know the difference between right and wrong. And we choose to do what is right. A person with right judgment avoids sin and lives out the values taught by Jesus Christ. The gift of truth, the gift of truth, that allows the person to respond prudently and happily to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gift of counsel or right judgment. That gift of the Holy Spirit enables you, capacitates you, empowers you to know right and wrong. Have you ever marveled at how many people seem to just not get it? Don't they know? I remember one time when I was younger, I probably was in my late teens. And you know, I grew up like a lot of you in upstate New York and uh, in an you know, Italian-American household. Now, uh, in, in my day, you would never think of bad-mouthing your mother. Uh, I have seen kids in supermarkets curse their mother with language that, that no drunken sailor would use. I've, I've witnessed it, perf you know, close hand. Curse out their mother, kids, you know, 12, 13, 15 years old. I saw it in the grocery store. In my day, I never heard of that. I never saw it. I certainly didn't do it. Why? I would have died. <laughs> Very simple. And I wouldn't have had to wait for my father to come home from work. My mother could have done it. My mother had proficiency in all household implements. She could beat my butt with a broom, a toilet plunger, a wooden spoon, you name it. She was qualified in all household weapons and not the slightest bit scared to use them. It was a different culture in those days. Now, kids sue their parents. <laughs> or, or the, you know, I'm not talking about child abuse here, okay? Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about physically abusing children. Kicking their butt? Yeah. You know, sometimes if they need it. You know, by their fruits you will know them. In philosophy, sometimes you can only know causes by their effects. You, you, you can only really know how good or bad a system is, a philosophy, by the effects. When I was young, and I'm not just saying this because now I'm not so young, because, you know, some, oh, that's just because you're older. Yeah, no, this is reality, hard, cold, objective reality. When you and I were younger, this was a much more civilized, polite, virtuous society. And it started at home.
the fruits of a permissive, intellectually and morally confused culture are what you have today. It's terrible. And it's not going to get better unless enough of us get serious about what we're doing. The Holy Spirit is the remedy. So counsel, right judgment, the ability to know right and wrong. Now, a certain amount of that is inherent. Everybody is given, uh, it comes with the human condition, you're given sufficient grace to be saved. And, and so there is such a thing as conscience. But without the Holy Spirit, your conscience is disabled. Fortitude, also a gift of the Holy Spirit. Fortitude, courage. Courage. With the gift of fortitude or courage, we overcome fear and are willing to take risks as a follower of Jesus Christ. A person with fortitude or courage is willing to stand up for what is right in the sight of God, even if it means accepting rejection, verbal abuse, or even physical harm or death. The gift of courage or fortitude allows people the firmness of mind that is required both in doing good and in enduring evil, especially with regards to goods or evil that are particularly difficult. Courage. Now, in the final presentation this afternoon, I'm going to talk at length about courage, boldness. A person with this gift of the Holy Spirit. Now think about it. Now, now you, you, most of you are very astute. Um, you know what's going on and what has gone on in our country, in the world, even in our church, in many cases. And we love our country. We love our church. And rightly so. We, we, we better. Because we're, we're lost without our mother, the church. And, and I know you love your country, and I do too. But, you know, love of country doesn't mean confirming your country in evil through guilty silence. That's not love of country. That's indifference at best, cowardice at worst. So the gift of fortitude or courage, that's a gift of the Holy Spirit. Is it any wonder we have little courage among politicians, appointed officials, judges, bishops, in many cases, priests, theologians, a decided lack of courage is a terrible curse on any institution, on any society. And in the end, the greatest courage ever displayed was Jesus Christ crucified. The power of the Holy Spirit. So we have to have that gift of fortitude or courage to stand up for what is right in the sight of God. Do you think for one moment that the world could be in the state that it is in if over one billion Catholics were imbued with the power of the Holy Spirit demonstrating courage? I tell you the world would be very different if we were living our faith. Western Europe is debilitated because they drifted away from the faith. Western Europe is absolutely impoverished morally, intellectually, economically, and it's getting worse by the minute. 
and the United States isn't far behind. Why would we do what they've done when we see the obvious results going downhill? And so are we. And the only remedy is the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you, you have to get in deeper union with the Holy Spirit. I know, I know, some of you may be thinking, yeah, Father, you know, talk is cheap, right? I mean, easy to say it, but it's hard to live it. Believe me, I know dozens, probably hundreds of physicians, nurses, pharmacists, lawyers, judges, politicians. It is not easy, and I am the first to admit it. It is not easy to stand up for what is right in the sight of God, day in and day out. It's easy for me to talk to you in this environment because actually it's easy every place I go. Uh, I've always had a receptive audience because they know what they're getting ahead of time. So the other guys don't come. You know, so I admit uh, my job is not hard. My job is pretty easy, speaking to good people like you. But I know you, see, here's the point. Sometimes they'll say, Father, don't you know you're preaching to the choir? You often hear that, right? Yeah, but these are the good people. Don't you know you're preaching to the choir? Oh, no, 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 no. You don't understand. You see, even Jesus, his main purpose was to confirm the brethren. My job is to confirm you in the faith, strengthen you, educate you, inspire you. Then it's your job to go out there. That's your mission. Your mission to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And it isn't easy, and I know it. But in the twinkling, the blink of an eye, this will be over. You and I are going to be standing before God. Life is a test. One of my favorite lines from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which quotes a document from the Second Vatican Council, is the story of human existence, I'm paraphrasing here, but, but the, 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 the history of human existence is the story of dour combat with the forces of evil. The history of human existence is the story of dour combat with the forces of evil. As St. Paul said, we are at war and our battle is not against flesh and blood, although it manifests itself through flesh and blood, behind it is a dark and sinister force perverse and perverting. And I tell you, even in the Catholic Church, I have continually run into it where too many people in positions of authority are too embarrassed about that part of our faith, and it's an essential part, too embarrassed to talk about it. We're knocking heads with the devil. It is a knockdown, drag out, bare knuckles brawl with Satan and his crew. And you might as well know that. You know, if a soldier <laughs> doesn't believe there's a war going on, you know, oh, there's no war, uh, and he just strolls out onto the battlefield without his weapons, forgetting his tactics, imagining somehow in his confusion, well, there is no war, there is no enemy. If there's no war and there's no enemy, then why fight? The great Archbishop Fulton Sheen used to say, if God is the one who says I am who am, then Satan is the one who says I am who am not. If he can convince us that he doesn't exist, why fight? Don't ever forget that. We are at war, and you have a unique, precious, unrepeatable place 
on the battle line. Right where you are, regardless of your profession, your state in life, you know, your mom, dad, husband, wife, butcher, baker, candlestick maker, doctor, lawyer, whatever it is, priest, religious, you have a unique, precious, unrepeatable place on the battle line. It is imperative that you perform the mission in season and out of season, convenient, inconvenient, accepted or rejected. Perform the mission. It's a matter of life or death. One time when I was preaching, an older lady came up to me and she said, and she was one of these, and I have some friends like this, quite a few of them. She had reached that age where she didn't care. You, you know what I mean? She had reached that point, she didn't care. She said, Father, I have discerned your greatest gift and it ain't preaching. I said, oh. And she looked me straight in the eye. She, she was about four feet tall. I think she was 85 or 88 or something. She looked me straight in the eye and said, your greatest gift, well, it's not preaching. Your greatest gift, and I, I won't say it exactly, but she said, your greatest gift is that you don't give a fat rat's deleted expletive what people think. And I said, well, thank you. <laughs> and, and you know, there, there's the, she, she had the Holy Spirit, you know. She, she had these gifts of wisdom and, and, and understanding and counsel and, and, and fortitude. Um, she was straight, you know, a straight shooter. No preacher, no priest, no parent can live their life afraid of what everybody else thinks. Because if you do that, you're useless. That salt that's lost its savor, as Jesus said, you know, salt that's lost its taste. Jesus said that. I'm not making this up. You know, it's in the Bible, right? Jesus says, we become like salt that's lost its taste and is good for nothing but to be thrown out and trodden underfoot. If you spend your life worried about what other people think, oh, you're one of those pro-life people, Oh, you're one of those Catholic people. Oh, you're against gay marriage. You're against fetal stem cell research. You're against euthanasia. You're against this, you know, trying to intimidate you. I, about eight or nine times I've been given a t-shirt. It's got a picture of a rat leading a donkey on a leash. And it says, you don't give a fat rat's And I'll be honest with you, I don't. <laughs> knowledge. With the gift of knowledge, we understand the meaning of God's revelation. I'm talking public revelation. Now, if I ask you, what are the three essential and interconnected elements of divine revelation, I know you would get it. You would say sacred scripture, sacred tradition, and magisterial teaching. With the gift of knowledge, we understand the meaning of God's revelation, especially expressed in the life and words of Jesus Christ. A person with knowledge is always learning more about the scriptures and tradition. Now, I know you know what scripture is. Do you know what sacred tradition is? Now, those of you who have been listening to me for almost 20 years, you know what it is. Not my fault if you don't know it. 
But uh, most Catholics could not define sacred tradition. And in the Catholic Church, sacred tradition has equal weight with sacred scripture. But if you don't even know what it is, you better find out. Divine revelation comes to us through scripture, tradition. The scripture, the written word of God. Tradition is the oral word of God, the spoken word that, that, that Jesus, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, transmitted to the apostles, who then handed it on under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to their successors, the bishops, in union with the Bishop of Rome. Scripture, tradition, we learn a lot about tradition from the fathers of the church, the doctors of the church, the saints of the church, and then magisterial teaching. Whether you have a word written or spoken, you have to have an authentic and authoritative interpreter of that word. That's the magisterium of the church. You have to have the gift of knowledge operating to know what it means. Piety or reverence. With that gift of the Holy Spirit, we have a deep sense of respect for God and his church. A person with the gift of piety recognizes our total reliance on God and comes before God with humility. Now, I can tell you sadly that I have run into a lot of arrogance among people in our church. Now, not everybody, but a significant amount of it. When I first started preaching uh, in my hometown, when, I, when I, I'd go home for summers, when I was doing my doctoral studies in Spain, and I stayed with my mother, uh, I would uh, celebrate Mass at the local parish and go home, and like clockwork, we'd be eating breakfast and the telephone would ring, and it would be a, a, a woman who'd been at Mass who would begin to upbraid me about what I had preached on that day. And uh, she totally misconstrued almost everything I said. She had no respect whatsoever. And uh, to, to boot, she was ignorant in plain English. But she, everybody has a right to complain. She did not have the gift of piety. She was always bad-mouthing the bishop bad-mouthing the pastor, bad-mouthing me. There's a certain reverence. Now, that doesn't mean you have to agree with everything. You know, you don't have to agree with evil or error. But there is a certain reverence required for God and the things of God, for the uh, uh, legitimate authority in the church. And, and, you know, a legitimate authority in civil society, too. We should be respectful. I know, I know sometimes that's hard. You know, you, you get politicians, appointed officials, and so forth, who seem to, you know, they just, it just seems like they've lost their mind. Sometimes we should be respectful. You don't have to agree, but we should be civilized and respectful. Gift of piety starts with God. Respect God. Have reverence for God and his church and all legitimate authority. Finally, fear of the Lord. With the gift of fear of the Lord, or as it's been called, wonder and awe, we are aware of the glory and majesty of God. The gift of the Holy Spirit, this gift of the Holy Spirit, enables us to realize that God is the perfections of all our hearts and minds desire. Fear of the Lord. Now, it's filial fear. It's not servile fear. When we say uh, to fear God, uh, the fear of the Lord, it, it doesn't mean a servile fear, like, ooh, I'm scared of God, he's going to put me in hell or something. No. It's respect. It's like the kind of respect that, that children should have for their father. You should respect your pastor. You should respect elected officials. Once again, you don't have to agree with everything, but there's a certain respect. This is very, very important. This also is degenerating in our society. And it all relates back to the Holy Spirit. 
And so you have these, this, this gift who contains all gifts. Now, I've just kind of briefly articulated the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. You can't have these gifts unless you have the Holy Spirit. And you can't have the Holy Spirit unless you're living in a state of grace. We receive the Holy Spirit at baptism. The only way you're going to lose them is through mortal sin, serious sin. If that happens, repent. If you're Catholic, go to confession. Try to persevere in a state of grace. And be aware, as St. Paul said, do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? And you know there's a theological reality. You don't have to remember the word, but it, it, in virtue of what we call the divine perichoresis or circumincession. Wherever one person of the Blessed Trinity is, there the other two must be. So does the Holy Spirit dwell within the soul in a state of grace? Yes. And by definition, so too then does the Father and the Son. We are temples of the most holy trinity. When we, be, when we begin to live that reality, then we'll radiate that to the world around us. Remember this, the darker the night sky becomes, the more brightly the stars of heaven shine. You are those stars. Be the light of the world the salt of the earth. Run the race to the finish line. Fight the good fight. It'll be over soon. And then you'll, you'll earn the, the fruits of, of victory. You know, Jesus went first. We know the last chapter of the book, as my mom likes to say. We win. Don't ever forget it. <laughs>